So it's not often that we get a chance to do something multi multidisciplinary and also to try, as the pre-hospital staff, for once, I'm going to make the ICU sweat, sweat instead of the other way around. Um, so what we're going to do as a, as a collaborative, we're going to go through two very, very sick kids, two very, very scary kids, and we're going to talk about the way that we as pre-hospital staff would think about these patients and how the emergency center and how the ICU would like us to think about these patients um, and how we can treat them as a team together. We're going to ask you to help us to make some decisions and there'll be a, one or two small prizes thrown in for interaction. So let's go. So you're working in the emergency department and someone brings in a nine month old. They've got a snotty nose. Mom says the baby's been breathing fast and had a cough for a day or two. So Andrew, when you look at this patient, what are you thinking? Right, so here's our, our patient when they arrive. So when you look at that video, what do you, what do you see? Cool. Okay, so I, I think um, uh, what I would like to, to uh, think about is just uh, trying to assess uh, how, how severe is this child's uh, respiratory distress. That's the complaint that they come in with and whether they're mild, moderate or severe is going to uh, uh, really uh, determine how I think about them and, and where, we, where we're going with this kitty. Uh, and so I just want to talk through uh, sort of things that we, we need to think about. So uh, what, what is the signs or the symptoms that a little baby gives us that's maybe unique to that sort of age group which is different from how we might assess an older child or an adult patient. And it's things like, uh, for example, um, uh, making assessment of their feeding, which for them is like their equivalent of getting on the treadmill or going to gym. But for, for us as, uh, as pediatricians, that's going to be a clue that they're actually, for example, not, not coping. So, so here's a, a sort of a guide. Uh, you know, once they are lethargic as that little baby was, uh, you, you're putting them, uh, you're thinking that they're more in the severe category. Uh, how technique they are. Um, uh, you know, the, the reality is that uh, babies have an age range of normality in terms of the respiratory rate and heart rate, uh, but the higher that is above normal, the more se uh, severe they are. So one needs to know the normal values. Um, uh, assessing their accessory muscle use, uh, how desaturated are they, if at all. Um, apneas is a warning sign, and then, for example, as I said, uh, in an older child, it might be can they talk in sentences, for example, versus in babies is asking that question, you know, are they able to, to feed? That's going to be your, your clue. And this is a guide. The more that you have um, in the, the one category, uh, you're putting them in that category, but it's not a formal scoring system. You, you're going to make a clinical impression as well. But I think that sort of assessment of, of severity and a tool to guide you in what to think about is important. Okay, so before you tell us whether you think it's mild, moderate or severe, let's have a, a very quick red card in the hand. So if you think that that child is mild, you can put your hand up, your card up now. If you think that child is moderate, you can put your card up now. And if you think that child's got a pretty severe respiratory distress, you can put your card up now. So what does the pediatrician think? I agree with you, severe. Pretty severe, <laughs> lovely. All right. You passed. Cool. Okay, but... Uh, the other important thing I think to think of is that not everything that breathes fast is a low respiratory tract infection or bronchiolitis. Uh, and so um, uh, we do need to think about uh, a differential for breathing fast. Kat, if you wouldn't mind. Move your hand, Meg. I'm going to show the acidotic breathing to the student tomorrow. Alright, if you, if you look at the eyes, which might be difficult to see on the video, very, very sunken. This was a, a kitty that um, had a history of diarrhea and vomiting, and that rapid but deep sort of sighing type of, of, uh, of breathing was actually from severe acidosis. Uh, and I can distinctly remember um, uh, nebbing a child as a, as a registrar recently returned from the UK and never having seen such shocked children before in the UK uh, for two hours, calling the consultant in saying, um, I don't know why this child's not getting better. Said consultant saying, have you done a gas? Uh, no, didn't think of that. Uh, very junior at the time, I should just say. 
and it turned out to be acidotic breathing, and not surprising that the nebs weren't clean. <coughs> okay, so uh, acidotic breathing uh, catches people out. And then uh, the other thing is uh, that, and you know, focusing on the respiratory illness uh, and the breathing, for example, to the uh, detriment of the assessment of other systems, and such as, for example, cardiac system and perfusion. And so clues to that this is actually a cardiac uh, thing going, going on is, is really important. Myocarditis always gets uh, misdiagnosed uh, uh, with, with dire consequences sometimes, but things like a significant tachycardia, um, uh, uh, signs, of, uh, signs of, of poor perfusion that you, you need to look for, otherwise you, you, won't, you won't see them, um, uh, is, is important. Can I yeah. maybe just point out that you don't want to diagnose the heart failure when you do the x-ray, but you should be looking when you're, seeing, when you're examining a child with severe despite your distress, you need to be clinically examining the heart at that point to deciding where's my apex, is there a big liver, to look for signs of cardiac failure at the same time as picking up signs of a despite your distress. Okay, so if we, if we think of what we would want our initial management, that baby in the first video, what are some things that you would like to, to use initially to manage that child? Cool. Okay, I forgot that part. Uh, <laughs> right, so <laughs> what should we have done for that, that, that uh, kitty first up? I uh, really like to emphasize that the basic uh, supportive uh, measures are where we, where we need to start before we start getting uh, fancy, and we mustn't freak out. So stay calm, relax, and um, uh, just put the kitty on some nasal prong oxygen. Uh, let's uh, often with these babies the nasal obstruction from the snotty nose is is half the the problem and reason for the respiratory distress so uh, clear the nose with with some nose drops with a um, potentially suctioning the nose stop the feeding like I said um, uh, that's uh, uh, going to the gym for them and they're not feeling like going to the gym right now so, so stop the feeding nasal gastric feeds or IV fluids depending if more IV fluids if they're severe um, and uh, so those sort of basic uh, supportive measures are important. And then NEBS. So NEBS upset the children, give them uh, a tachycardia. Um, and, uh, you know, in bronchiolitis, uh, generally do not uh, change the course of that illness. So think carefully about what your underlying disease process is uh, and whether actually giving a NEB is, is a good idea because it can make things worse. So you've done your basics for 30 minutes, and now we've got to a point where we reassess and our respiratory rate is still 70. The stats are still 92 and below on nasal prongs, and the kid is looking lethargic, holding on to mom. So audience, what would your next moves be? If you'd like to give that child some non-invasive support, some CPAP or high flow, you can use your green card. If you think it's time for an intubation, you can use your red card. If you'd like to nib, you can put your hands up. And if you'd like to wait a little bit longer and see if things improve, you can just cross your arms. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So I'm seeing lots of green cards. So we're thinking of some non-invasive. Lots of, lots of waiting. Yeah. I'm thinking the, the, the waiting is also the phoning someone to ask them what they think. All right, Andrew. So. What are you thinking? Yes, we're going to talk about, um, I, I think, what, what probably would be the um, uh, ideal next step, and that is uh, some uh, high flow or, or CPAP, uh, so some non-invasive respiratory support to, um, to support this kitty. And the question is, uh, do you have um, that in your setting? We would just be interested to know first up. So green is a yes and red is a no. Okay, yeah. so there's a lot of people that aren't sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, so um, uh, let's let's talk about uh, CPAP and, and high flow because it's it's quite topical in in pediatrics and becoming more and more widely used, which was evidenced by by your response is that you do have it in your setting. Uh, here, I think. Um, uh, it is important to, to think about when to use it and when not to use it. Uh, and the reason for that is um, we don't want to overuse it 
from the point of view that, um, uh, or use it inappropriately, I should say, because it is quite a costly intervention. The second thing is we don't want to use it when we should actually be doing a higher level of respiratory support. So that's really important, uh, that one of the ways that you might do harm is if actually this, this child needs, needs intubation. On the other hand, we do want to, um, to use it if it's going to be of benefit. So here are, the, are some suggestions. Basically, if you do have a bronchiolitis or respiratory uh, 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 pneumonia or illness, and you have severe respiratory distress, like we discussed, and that's why the assessment's important, I think it's a good go-to option. And there is increasing evidence for its use in asthma, limited evidence, but it is starting to come, and our experience is good with these, with these kids. Um, also think about it in um, possible other causes like uh, cardiac conditions or if you're going to intubate someone as a pre-oxygenation strategy. But be aware that if there's an absolute indication for intubation like prolonged apneas or severe um, ARDS or something like that, then you actually need to get on and intubate the child. Any sort of anatomical or trauma abnormality to the face, blocked nasal passages, uh, that sort of thing, um, don't do it. And then slightly controversial, and maybe we'll discuss this a little bit later with the second case, is when you've got uncorrected shock, potentially something like CPAP uh, might, be, might be harmful, so you need to, to think about that. Okay. Um, right. Why, what, what is it? What's, what's the big idea? And I, I like this, um, this uh, diagram on the left because it, 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 it tells you how, how we think it's working. Um, so these children have upper airway obstruction from their increased work of breathing. They also have low air obstruction from blocked airways and they have a degree of collapse because of air trapping and then a subsequent um, absorption of that air and collapse through blocked airways. And the high flow in the CPAP is meant to splint the upper airway. So keep those open and reduce their work of breathing by opening up airways, preventing atelectasis, increasing functional residual capacity. So it makes sense how, how, how it might be working and, and supporting the breathing. Um, so here we have um, the core components, which is high flow is heated, humidified, um, high flow, uh, oxygen administration. So we have uh, a flow meter, which will determine your liters, oxygen blender, a heater and humidifier, and some nasal prongs. And one of the big advantages of high flow is the fact that it's relatively easy to set up compared to CPAP, and it's well tolerated by, by patients because it's less sort of tight on the face, it's less finickety to get a good seal. Uh, it does provide some peep the higher the flow goes, uh, but it must not be a closed system like CPAP because the flows are quite high, two liters per kilo per minute for the first 10 kilos. Uh, and so we don't want to close and explode patients. Um, <laughs> you also, importantly, must not use normal nasal prongs. One, they don't they're not designed to take that amount of flow. And secondly, the nasal prongs that are designed for the purpose have much shorter distance between this uh, circuit limb here, which is heated and humidified, and the actual patient. So we're trying to keep, the, one of the key aspects of the therapy is that it must be heated and humidified to do its job. Uh, and then with CPAP, um, looks slightly different. Same, same humidifier gets used. Uh, this is an example of bubble CPAP, but here you have the, uh, the, the patient interface where you've got to get that tight seal either with a mask or prongs um, in order for it to work effectively. The advantage of CPAP is you can measure the PEEP that you, you, you're giving, which you can't do in high flow, um, and it is more, more support than, than CPAP and probably works better in little people, very little people. Okay, so here is our patient. Uh, one hour later, after being put onto high flow. Hello. So you can see much more awake now, less lethargic, still got respiratory distress, but, but much less so able to, to play with the, the oxygen piping. Very satisfying. Uh, of interest, uh, this was an Australian study. Just showing you, this is um, 
use of respiratory support modality in bronchiolitis across a whole bunch of Australian ICUs, and you can see the massive increase in high flow for bronchiolitis since about 2010, okay? Uh, and the concomitant uh, drop in adjusted risk for, for intubation. So the whole idea behind non-invasive respiratory support is that it hopefully will reduce the need for ICU admission and, and intubation, but particularly ICU admission. Okay. And I think that those are really important parts for us as pre-hospital staff with a changing scope of practice. Um, and there's lots of services that do high flow and, and CPAP. Um, so it's a really important part of us bringing critical care out of the ICU and out of the emergency center and to the roadside to our referring hospitals. Yes. Um, and then lastly, I just want to uh, say that the big uh, uh, RCT uh, got published um, uh, last year or this year, the Paris trial, and this is sort of their summary slide of, of their approach. And I just wanted to, to, to point out that w what they're emphasizing is, and what they showed in that study is, is that um, uh, there was no harm in delaying the administration of, of high flow. Um, rather start off with, um, remember these was a group of patients that just had bronchiolitis and needed oxygen, but if they just met those criteria and you started them on oxygen immediately, there was no uh, benefit to starting them on high flow initially in that group as opposed to standard oxygen and only if they remained hypoxemic or didn't respond did you move to high flow. So I think there's a shift from putting it on straight away to maybe doing those basic things first and then uh, considering escalation of care. Um, yeah. And Shamil, is that your experience that Red Cross is using increasing amounts of non-invasive ventilation? You know, definitely. You know, I think we've seen a huge increase in the amount of kids going on to high flow. CPAP, good results. We're intubating fewer kids. But I think one does need to caution people and be mindful if you're working in public hospitals that all of the things have cost. So just to put somebody on high flow, it's expensive. You know, it's the consumables are expensive. The machinery is expensive. The oxygen that you're using costs us. We don't often think about the oxygen costs, but if you think about higher flows that you're going to need. So there are some hidden costs to high flow as well as CPAP. We do find that children tolerate the high flows a lot better than the CPAP because it's like nasal prong, a little bit higher flow. But CPAP was hard work just to size, get the apparatus to fit correctly into the nostrils, to seal. If kids cry and their mouths are open, you often don't generate PEEP. So it's a lot more technically um, challenging to keep a kid on CPAP and to deliver effective CPAP. Um, you know, a kid is crying, was hypoxic, was irritable, was feverish, put, they often pull things out. So we often use some anxiolytics just to make them a bit more compliable to, to the CPAP, to calm them down a little bit, to make them less anxious. Yes. One more point okay. is that, you know, we're using a lot of CPAPs and high flows but you've got to check responses to therapies. So you, you started somebody on CPAP and high flow, and you need to make sure that their respiratory rates are coming down. I'm not sure if I'm cutting into no, no, a bit. No, no, it's perfect, yeah. So you need to check that, res that it's actually effective. You know, so how long do you give somebody on CPAP to see that it's going to work? And sometimes we see people get left on CPAP too long, and then you're intubating kids as an emergency. So somehow, if you're starting somebody on non-invasive ventilation, you need to actually be checking that the FI2 requirements are coming down, their work of breathing is reducing, their respiratory rates are coming down. And if, if everything is heading in the wrong direction, you something, at some point you need to say, at which point do I stop non-invasive ventilation and head towards intubation? And that's still a gray area. Do you give them an hour? Do you give them two? So that's still something that I think that needs to be defined. And that's definitely something that we've seen. So we use non-invasive um, ventilation in our aircrafts, and we actually have a very low threshold for escalating care. So we have uh, quite a low FiO2 limit. We don't transport patients above a certain um, FiO2 on CPAP because we think that it's used in quite an interesting way in some of the services where they think 15 minutes on 100% with high PEEP, that's fine just to get to a referring hospital. But we go long ways in confined spaces, and as Neville was talking about later, the earlier, the last place you want to be intubating a patient is in an aircraft or in an incubator in an aircraft. So it's a, quite an, um, there's lots of different ways of applying CPAP, but we've had great success, um, and it's a really safe 
um, way to transport a kid who's just sick enough to need a little bit more support. Um, and as an occasional intubator, is what I would call myself, we, we intubate a lot of patients, but I don't intubate enough neonates to feel comfortable <laughs> intubating them all the time. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's a, it makes me feel a little bit um, more reassured. Great. So to summarize it, it really, uh, I think, has been a bit of a, a game changer. One of the, the big things has been with the growing evidence base is it's shown that it's safe. Okay, so, so get familiar with using it. Know, know your equipment, as, as um, people have said earlier today. Use it for uh, in, in the appropriately selected patients. Know that uh, when it's not working and you need to escalate, um, but, but it's, a, it's a good thing. Right. Okay. All right, so our second case is... Joe, do you a want ten to start? Month. So I, uh, they phoned from a, a, a referral hospital far, far away from you. And they say, I've got a 10-month-old. He's got a one-day history of being quite lethargic and feverish. Um, Mom reports no significant medical history. This, this child doesn't have any chronic medication or any illnesses and has been growing well. I'm phoning because I think this child is a little bit septic. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. So when the child arrives in your med reg, they call you down as the ICU consultant and say, we're a bit worried and we're very busy. So when you assess the child, <coughs> the child has the vitals as you, that you see on the screen. Yeah. And after assessment, your, your uh, differential is that you think this child has an pneumonia, sure. uh, has a pneumonia and you're concerned about how shocked the child yeah. is. So how important do you think the definition of shock is in yeah. general? So, you know, there's been updated definitions in the adult literature about sepsis, sepsis 3. Those definitions, you know, they don't really include neonates and children. So when, we, when we're looking at this child, I mean, the things that worries me, you know, there, there's a few things that we're just looking at, at he, just on the, on the clinical examination. You know, the, the high fever. Don't ever forget the glucose, okay? We've got a kid who's sick who probably hasn't been feeding well. So that sugar, you know, as a, remember H's and T's as causes of cardiac arrest needs to be addressed quite soon. We've got a child who's, who's very tachypneic, who's very tachycardic, you know. They often teach us at medical school, you know, thin 3D pulses as signs of shock, but when you're going at a heart rate of 180, it's very difficult to feel a 3D pulse. And it's often useful to compare peripheral pulses to central pulses. We've got a capillary refill time of four seconds, but the child's got a normal blood pressure, so we can talk about that a little bit later. But in terms of definitions of, of sepsis, I mean, what are we actually talking about? We're talking about, a ch we're talking about a con really an interaction with worrying about an infection, which could be viral or bacterial. And more and more, you know, we often just think bacterial sepsis, but we have viral syndromes which behave very similarly. And we've seen children with influenza, um, H1N1, other influenzas that have actually been presented with severe septic shock. And then you've got a host response. You've got your body's reaction to this infection. You know, do they, are they pyrexial? Are they hypothermic? Are they bradycardic? Are they tachycardic? Some of them even go apneic as you're in your small neonates. And you're trying to really think about, you know, is there an infection? How severe is this infection? And we're talking, when we're talking severe sepsis, we're probably saying is that there could be two organ systems. Is the child in respiratory failure? Is it potentially cardiovascular failure? And we're talking about shock. We're saying somebody that's, that's probably resistant to fluids. So, no. you know, we often get attuned to fast heart rates in pediatrics. So 180, you know, in a 10 month uh, fast, okay, acceptable, what do you guys think? It's fast, okay? So often we get used to fast heart rates in small kids. I put this chart up on the APLS manual because it tells you what normal values are for children of different ages. If a neonate, if a baby is just born has a heart rate of 180, that's probably a little bit fast, just within the bounds of normality. But if you're five, you know, or you're six years old, a heart rate of 180 is incredibly fast. And in pediatrics, we often get attuned to these fast heart rates in smaller kids. But when you see an older child, you think, ah, oh, it's probably okay. 
So just to always contextualize the physiological data that you get, so is the heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rates for the child in front of you appropriate for that age? So if you've done the APLS course, you know, this, this chart is in the manual, just in terms of what's normal and our, for children of different ages, and you should probably keep this on your phone or stuck up on a wall somewhere. So we're going to talk about interventions. So, All right, so for a prize, what would your first intervention be? What would be one of the first things you were thinking of? Hands up, anyone? Watch time. Yeah. What would your first intervention be? What would you be thinking of? Uh. <laughs> right, at the back there, yeah. <laughs> what would you be thinking of? A fluid bolus. So you can have a baddie and badge. Yeah. All right, uh, Chuck, what are your thoughts on fluid? So, so maybe just to talk a little bit, go back to, you guys all remember your Frank Starling curve, right? Right? Everyone's favorite. <laughs> yes, so we, we heard there's, there's a, a fluid bolus being, being mentioned, but you know, I probably would have given some dextrose, you know, some fluid bolus dextrose, they were, the sugar was too, I would have corrected that glucose up initially, two moles per kg of a 10% um, fluid to correct the glucose. But, you know, if the child's in shock, you know, we often get, get taught about shock as hypovolemic shock, septic shock, dissociative shock, leaky capillaries, and we think of them in silos. But the truth is that they often coexist altogether. So the septic child is often a little bit hypovolemic, has got some myocardial dysfunction, has got leaky capillaries, and they coexist. And one needs to do a little bit of everything. So to remind you about um, what you need. And at the bedside, you know, how good are we at deciding um, whether somebody's heart is beating effectively, has got good myocardial function? Are we good? probably not as good as we think we are. But if you're wanting to know how good your myocardial function is and whether they're able to handle the volume, you know, Frank Starling teaches us so that if you've got good cardiac function or good contractility, if you give somebody a fluid bolus, then you increase cardiac output quite significantly or stroke volume. But if you're in septic shock and you've got poor contractility, the improvement in stroke volume or cardiac output is very little. So, which organ in the abdomen can you feel that might give you a, a, an, a, an indication as to whether your heart is beating strongly or not? Hands up, Nick. The liver? liver? Yes. So how does the liver help you? Sorry? Yeah. Is that your bit? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so if somebody feels, so before you're giving a fluid bolus, okay? I would feel to see how big the liver is. With your, so who does that routinely? You want to show me a green card before you give that fluid bolus? <laughs> Keep the <girl. laughs> you know? so, so some of the theories is that, you know, so in adult medicine, you guys do the straight leg raising test which, to predict fluid responsiveness. Doesn't work in pediatrics because the volume of blood in the legs is very low. So some of the theory is that if you, if you can't feel a liver and you think somebody is shocked, you're probably hypovolemic. If you can feel a big liver, you've got to say, Oof, you know, and then this, this, this is some gray areas here. You could still be hypovolemic and have a big liver, but to know before you give your fluid bolus what to feel what the size is. If you've got a 10 centimeter liver to begin with, you know, and you've got signs of shock, the chances are that you've probably got right heart failure and your right ventricle's not contracting adequately and you're getting back pressure and you're, you're in right heart failure and that's why your, your liver is enlarged. So, so think about feeling the liver and hopefully in the future before you drop that fluid bolus, you feel the liver beforehand and decide, am I in cardiogenic shock? And very similarly to, I think the x-ray that Andrew showed earlier, the kid with the big heart, if that child had signs of shock and you'd given the child with myocarditis a fluid bolus, you might have pushed him into pulmonary edema. So think about livers and if you, 
If the liver's not too big, you know, we have a large population of kids with HIV. Uh, you know, what's a big liver? Is two a big liver? Three centimeters? But you always have to have a reference point to, to notice, to know what the liver was before you gave your fluid bolus. So, so, some, so who, who uses ringers? And who uses normal saline? Maybe people use ringers. Show me a green card. Ringers. Saline a, a red card. Does it matter? <laughs> you use both. <laughs> I probably use both yeah. as well. And so, so the question is, does it matter? <laughs> so there's, you know, fluid controversies have been, has been going on for decades. So crystalloids, is it colloids? Now we've decided on crystalloid and now debating the types of crystalloid. So my, my personal preference is for ringers. And, and, and the rationale for that is, is that normal saline, you know, if you're giving large volumes of normal saline, there's lots of chloride in it. And if you're giving children big fluid boluses or large volumes of fluid boluses, that excess chloride makes them hypochloremic. And then it might actually cause a hypochloremic metabolic acidosis. So my personal preference is to use ringers. And do you use 10 mils per kg or 20 mils per kg? Sorry? I'm getting a mumble. I can't hear clear. 20 or 10? It depends. I'm getting it depends. He's a politician, Lunga. <laughs> you know? And the traditional teaching has always been 20, 10 to 20, you know? But you've got to make a decision. If you're at the bedside, the book says 10 to 20. Am I going to go 10? Am I going to go 20? You know? And if anything, in, in for fluids in pediatrics, we've gone smaller volumes with more frequent reassessments. And you know, if, if you look at the American guidelines, I'm not saying that I, I don't do what the Americans do, but the current American yes, you are. Uh, <laughs> 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 the, the, the current um, critical care guidelines from the Americans in pediatrics and septic shock advocates large volumes of fluids. So in the first five minutes, if you look at it, in the, if, you, if you arrive, if a child arrives in shock in an American um, ED in shock, that child potentially might get 60 mils per kg within the first 10 minutes. You know? It's a huge amount of fluid. So I've put that up just to, to demonstrate what the American doing, Americans are doing, and this is current practice. We've probably gone a lot more conservative. Have you guys heard of the FEAST trial? Want to tell us about the FEAST trial? <laughs> so, so the FEAST trial was a large randomized control trial done in East Africa looking at children who were randomized to either no fluid boluses or receiving crystalloids or colloids. And they showed an increase in mortality in children who received a fluid bolus. So huge concern in terms of the dangers of giving too much fluid too quickly. And essentially what we're saying is that one needs to, if children are hypovolemic and you think they're hypovolemic, you should be giving them fluids. We should be giving smaller fluid boluses and reassessing the response to that fluid bolus. Um, once you, and when do you, and the next question is how much fluid do you give before giving, starting an inotrope? How many mils per kg would that be? And yeah. So you're going to give fluids until they stop responding to, yeah. you know? So any other thoughts? Come on, Fatima. <laughs> Yeah. So we're thinking we need to think about what the cause of the shock could be. We're saying smaller volumes. And generally what we're doing at the moment is that once you're reaching about 40 mils per kg of fluid, you're thinking if they're still hypotensive, adding an inotrope at that point. That's, that's, that's the way we've moved. So 
if you're reaching 40 mL per kg of fluid, we're saying you're probably in fluid refractory shock, and we need to be thinking about starting an inotrope. So, what's your favorite inotrope? Come on, everybody has a favorite inotrope. I like, I like that answer, the one that we have. The one that we have. <laughs> <laughs> And the important question to ask is, how do you choose an inotrope? And I tend to say, you know, you choose the inotrope depending on what's wrong with your patient and the effect that you're trying to achieve. So in our first patient who had a normal blood pressure, who was shocked, I might have actually used dobutamine, hopefully, yeah, you know? Because dobutamine is going to be inotropic. It will, might drop your blood pressure a little bit, I can run it safely peripherally, it doesn't cause any skin necrosis. But if my patient was hypotensive and I needed to increase systemic vascular resistance, dobutamine might actually drop blood pressures further and it might not be the appropriate inotrope to choose. Anybody still use dopamine? Don't be shy. <laughs> dopamine? So more and more in, in pediatrics are moving away from dopamine. Many people might have dopamine available, but we're moving more and more to your, it's using adrenaline peripherally. Now, you know, sometimes it just feels wrong to use, people feel scared about using adrenaline, because adrenaline infusions, you know, it's like, whoa, this kid's really sick. But more and more, if kids are shocked and they're hypotensive and they're in severe septic shock, you know, people are advocating using adrenaline infusions peripherally, you know, starting at low doses, starting at about 0 0.02 mics per kg per minute peripherally, um, in children with severe shock. So why, whether you're putting the, a second peripheral line up in a big vein or putting an IO line to, to try and improve hemodynamics. Anyway, so that's, so any questions on fluids, inotropes? So the one comment I'll make is I, I have a memory of being um, very stressed with a very, very sick child who was, and um, he was on the phone to Prof Argent and he and I were both trying to calculate an inotrope that I've never heard of, trying to calculate the infusion, and it was a very stressful environment. And um, so if you're struggling to calculate an inotrope infusion for a kid on the uh, EM guidance app under the EMCT guideline, the emergency medicine guidelines, there's a whole set of um, infusions which tell you exactly how much to put in your syringe and things like yeah. that. So work smart, not hard. Yeah. And remember, in pediatrics, it's mics per kg per minute. You know, it's not just one ampule at a time of and a drug. And that's not how so a normal person's brain works, either. <laughs> Are you calling me not normal? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling you smart. Okay, great. So we've, we've yeah. given our fluid, we've given our inotropes, and we aren't seeing an improvement in the patient. They're still very lethargic. Yeah. So what are we starting to think of now? Yeah. Any questions from you in the audience about fluid resuscitations or inotropes or... Anything, anything you want, you want to hand, ask questions at the end? Don't be scared. So I, I just wanted to make, make a comment that the, the 40 moles per kg is not an absolute, it's, yeah. a, it's a consider. And uh, I think the, the growing realization is that if you are putting lots of fluid in because they're still shocked, that that is leaking out uh, yeah. and the heart is not necessarily coping. Yeah. So you're possibly starting inotropes and then giving more fluid. Yeah. It's not that you're, you're limiting your, your fluid resuscitation or that they don't need more fluid. It's just that you're supporting the, yeah. the, the cardiac function. Yeah. Um, so who in the audience is comfortable intubating children? Okay. Who has intubated a child? Okay. So many, and experiences, thoughts? <coughs> Difficult, easy? Were you scared? Yeah, you know. So by definition, pediatric airways are difficult, you know. And if you're intubating children, you know, one's, one's got to be thinking about anticipating problems. Everything's obviously smaller, but the approach to intubating a child can be very, very difficult, different to, to an adult. And uh, we'll go through an intubation checklist a little bit later but you're looking at the child in front of you and, you and you're trying to anticipate potential problems that you might encounter to make the intubation as, as safe as possible. So, any opinions on using cuff to uncuff tubes? Why? 
Aren't you going to just call Strido and airway obstruction? Sorry? It's less air leak, yeah? You don't necessarily need to inflate your cuff, absolutely. You can? You can measure the cuff pressure, yeah? But traditionally, you know, we, we've always used in pediatrics uncuffed ET tubes, and there's always a concern about subglottic damage, damaging to the airway. But more and more in pediatrics, we're heading towards using cuffed ET tubes in children with stiff lungs needing high pressure ventilation. Okay? What about drugs for intubation? And I, and I take you back to the previous slide. If you're thinking of how to, what drugs are you going to use or method, you need to be thinking about what's wrong with my kid. Most of these kids have got airway obstruction, stridor, and if you've got a kid with stridor, with, with, with you expecting an obstructed airway, you're probably wanting to get an anesthetist involved, something that can gas the child down. You want to keep the child breathing spontaneously. You don't want to be using a, a muscle relaxant, because if you paralyze a child with airway obstruction, you're in real trouble. Okay? So, what's your favorite intubation drug? Ketamine. Say, there's a lot of paramedics here, so I know what so. answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, ketamine, I mean, I probably use ketamine in 99% of my intubations. It's, it's hemodynamically stable, you know, you can, it's, it's effective. Any, so, a usual dose is sort of one to two milligrams per kg, once again. But if kids are severely septic, one often needs very little bit of ketamine. So I will start at a milligram per kilogram of ketamine in a severely septic child, because what it does is it can actually blunt your endogenous catecholamine output, and then you get a child that goes bradycardic and hypotensive afterwards. Oral or nasal? Sorry? Age dependent? Whatever you're comfortable with, okay? So in an emergency situation, when you're faced with a child who's crashing, who's hypoxic, who's shocked, you know, most adult practitioners who are asked to look after kids are more used to putting in oral ET tubes, okay? Pediatricians prefer nasal, nasal tubes, but once you're proficient at putting in nasal tubes, it's probably as quick as putting in an, an oral tube. But do what's safest for your patient. Once we're in intensive care and you're more stable and you're out of shock, we prefer nasal tubes because you can strap them to your face and then more secure. But in the recess situation, you do what's quickest and safest. So this is just a quick run through. I'm running out of time. Just a quick run through an intubation checklist that we have. So when you plan your intubation, don't just hope that everything's going to be there. But you know, there's a, I think one has to have some rigor. You know, do you have the right equipment? You know. Have a look to see if there's anything potentially dangerous. Can your patient open their mouth, you know? Think about drugs. We spoke a little bit about ketamine. Do we have correct monitoring equipment? ECGs, SATs, entitled CO2 monitors, very important. You know, do you have a, does the bulb on your laryngoscope work? Do we need new batteries? Is your suction working, you know? Think about drugs we spoke about. So. Go through a checklist before you intubate to make sure that you've got everything ready. Um, document potentially any complications. So we spoke a little bit about, and I'm out of time, I think, um, to talk about cuffed ET tubes. And some of the cuffs are quite long. We, we prefer to use smaller micro cuffs, which are placed quite distally in, in the airway. And if you just look at sort of your uncuffed tubes, children have very short airways. You know. Another reason, if you're intubating them oddly, they might act one centimeter out, could be a child who's extubated. So, micro cuffs, they're very nice and small and don't damage airways. And if you can't intubate and ventilate kids, you know, most people think, ah, oh, I can't intubate this kid. But if you can bag mask ventilate somebody and oxygenate them, then you can keep them alive. In 22 years of pediatrics, you know, uh, fortunately haven't needed to go the surgical route but if you've got access to an LMA, if you can't intubate somebody, you know, you could also use an LMA to, to ventilate somebody. I think that's it. So let's summarize quickly. The, um, what we've talked about is fluid, uh, inotropes, even if they're through a provincial per, per line, mm -hmm. and oxygenating. Yeah. I think that what's important here, and I think the message we'd like to close with that we discussed with, 
is that that is um, those are all things that are available to you even in a lower resource setting and so we'd encourage you to recognize and treat shock as best as you can. Thank you. Thank you.